Good, good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, today's global talk at the Center for Global Studies. My name is Martin Bunton. I am the interim director at the center. I'm filling in for the director, Oliver Schmitka, who, with his family, is in a, a, a research leave in Eastern Europe. And of course, our thoughts are with uh, Oliver and Biatin family, and our thoughts are, of course, with all the members of our community who have loved ones or family um, in, in danger um, today. Uh, the Center for Global Studies is located on the traditional territories of the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples, whose historical ties to this land uh, remain to this day. And it is a wonderful pleasure to be able to, we're so grateful to be able to host um, my friend, colleague in history, Sergei Yakelchik, for today's talk on um, uh, Ukraine. I will uh, introduce him in a moment. Let me just go through very briefly through some uh, housekeeping items. We do ask that you keep your microphone and your video muted, often muted, during uh, Sergei's presentation. But um, in, in the, during the presentation, feel free to use the chat function in Zoom. If you have some questions you would like to post, we will monitor the chat or some uh, links or some make some observations. It's been quite a uh, productive, useful uh, function for these discussions. We will then, after Sergey's talk, we will have a discussion period um, where you will feel free to ask a question or, or make a comment observation. You can either do that again through chat or um, what we will ask if you're feeling comfortable is for all of you to put your video uh, on, but keep your microphone muted unless you have a question to sort of try to stimulate a bit of more of a collegial uh, environment for discussion. And as you all know, the presentation is being recorded. Um, Sergey, a colleague of mine in history, as well as a member and former chair of the German and Slavic Studies Department. Uh, Sergey received his BA from Kyiv University and an MA from the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences. He has numerous publications on Ukraine, Russia, European history. Um, he's a long collaborator with members at the Center for Global Studies. So we're, we're so fortunate to have this relationship with Sergey and to continue to build on it. His research interests include the social and political history of the Stalin period, as well as the formation of a modern Ukrainian nation from the mid 19th century to the present. Um, I've been um, attending Sergey's talks for many years now. He long ago convinced me that Ukraine was one of the most important countries in the world. And I can't think of a, 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 a better uh, scholar to lead us through these uh, travel discussions today. Sergey, thank you so much. Thank you, Martin, and thank you all for uh, participating today either in person or via uh, internet. And um, it's my pleasure to talk to your audience today also because this is not uh, the audience for which I would have to explain really simple things, but rather it's the audience which would help me engage with uh, more serious questions and make sense of uh, of the trends that are still only emerging, coalescing, and that would or might become important in the near future. So I'm going to start with uh, some theoretical propositions and then um, go on from the trying to explain the processes we are now witnessing. So one theoretical proposal would be, of course, to consider the nature of uh, national identities in the 21st century um, and also to understand the relation between uh, democracy and authoritarianism through the prism of uh, a national identity defined as political and the national identity defined or as ethnic or imperial. Um, so my, my entry point would be actually to um, start with uh, Mr. Putin's real uh, disappointment and failure in the early stage of this military campaign against Ukraine. Um, military specialists have noted early on that the Russian strategy seemed odd from the start. 
um, because Russia tried to defeat the Ukrainian side with uh, paratroopers being uh, parachuted into Ukrainian cities in the hope um, in the hope of uh, or del delivered by um, helicopters to a nearby field with the hope that that would be enough to actually establish the Russian control over Ukraine. It became obvious early on that that was not enough. Uh, so why would Russia choose such a strategy to start with? An obvious explanation is that um, there was an expectation on the part of Mr. Putin and uh, Russian military advisors and everybody around him that it would be enough to knock out the Ukrainian political leadership and the country will collapse on its own. So why would they have why would they have a notion like that and build a major campaign which now needs to unfold through a different, much more deadly and more difficult for Russia also stage of moving uh, nearly the entire Russian infantry uh, into Ukraine and um, perhaps in the process also abandoning the plans of occupying all of Ukraine, seeing that things are going that badly in Eastern and Central Ukraine. So the explanation would then of course be um, anchored in the notion of identity as it is entertained by Mr. Putin. That's a curious one. It, um, uh, his vision of Russian identity combines two strands, the, imper to the imperial and the ethnic one. So much like Hitler before him, he believes in blood and belonging. That is, uh, people who are ethnic Russians but live in Ukraine are of course waiting for Russia to liberate them. Also, people who are ethnic Ukrainians but speak Russian and are acculturated to Russian culture are equally waiting for Mr. Putin to defend them from the alleged neo-Nazi Ukrainian nationalists. Um, so some of us thought it was actually Russian propaganda but it turned out to be the worldview on which the invasion was in fact based. So as a result, the Ukrainian forces, including the volunteers, managed to, def managed to basically kill the top elite paratroopers Russia had. So Russia is now scrambling for any other paratroopers to be sent into Ukraine. And notably, it's sending the Chechen fighters who are you know, famous for committing atrocities among other things, but they too end up being killed. So what's happening then? Um, so Mr. Putin's concept of Russia, as I said, combines the imperial worldview with an ethnic one. So the ethnic one dictates that ethnic Russians and Russian speakers um, around the former Soviet Union by default identify with Russia because that's what ethnic belonging is. Uh, but the imperial concept also says that whatever state is near Russia must be interested in being friendly with Russia and or hopefully joining Russia too. And these two things, perhaps Mr. Putin does not realize it, but they're actually in a certain type of a tension. Uh, the tension is quite visible in the Ukrainian case. Uh, the Soviet Union did recognize that um, Ukraine and Russia were two different nations. For that reason, the Soviet Union had a separate Soviet Republic of Ukraine. Uh, the Russian Empire, however, did not recognize ethnic difference between Ukrainians and Russians. It banned publications in the Ukrainian language and the Russian Empire actually suppressed the Ukrainian national movement, including even the cultural component. And when we look at the combination of the imperial and ethnic worldview, you would realize immediately that they sort of call for different strategies going forward politically. Uh, one of them calls for ethnic affinity. Uh, the other one calls for recognizing the greatness of Russia and the desire for all uh, to join Russia. So they, there is actually a tension even within his own worldview. Um, furthermore, the expectation that the Ukrainian cities would uh, fall fairly quickly was particularly uh, predicated on the fate of Kharkiv, a very large city of 1.5 million before the start of the war, which is located right next to the Russian border. 
uh, lots of people that have family connections to Russia and the overwhelming majority spoke Russian. So Kharkiv was thought to be, Kharkiv was thought to be an easy target, but as it turned out, it's proving extremely difficult for the Russian army to take it. We also saw ethnic Russians in the areas of the Donbass, which was thought to be also another region very easy to conquer, volunteering for the Ukrainian territorial defenses to fight against Russia. And that, that brings me to the notion of what Ukrainian identity is. The Ukrainian identity following the collapse of the Soviet Union was defined as anti-imperial and democratic. Perhaps it was not immediately obvious to the observers of Ukraine because it was a rather chaotic democracy and a rather corrupt democracy, but democracy it was nonetheless. And so Mr. Putin didn't realize that um, modern 21st century political or civic identity developed in Ukraine for which uh, Ukrainian nationalism was not a, the only defining factor, but the notion of a country which is not Russia, the opposite to Russia, different from the authoritarian uh, regime of Mr. Putin himself, was an important part of their political identity. And you would see it in a variety of examples. Um, there of course, all kinds of ethnic groups uh, fighting in this war. There was a photograph circulated yesterday from a synagogue in Kiev where the uh, Ukrainian army personnel was praying, uh, but they are of course Jews, but they're in the uniforms of uh, the Ukrainian army. Um, so this, this becomes then a fight of a very modern 21st century identity against the identities coming from the 19th and 20th century. The imperial one, in which it is a loyalty to the great Putin and the general idea of Russia that matters. And the ethnic one, in which the Russian ethnic identity and the criteria of language and blood um, are sought to be determining uh, political allegiances. What I'm saying then is that Mr. Putin came from the past. Uh, so the headline from the Times Magazine, The Return of History, is in a way misleading. It's more like Mr. Putin is taking his country back into history and thus threatening to take Europe back into the 20th century. So if we return back to the military strategy then, the change we have seen in the last few days had something to do with more willingly bombarding the big cities. Apparently, the calculation of the Russian Federation's authorities was that they would not really need to bombard or perhaps even take big Ukrainian cities because it would be enough to blockade them. And as we know from the plans leaked by the British and American intelligence, um, to starve the population, to scare the population, and then propose to the population to escape. And then, and then take the government. Now, it's actually very interesting that they did so in the case of Kiev just a few days ago. Um, even so, everything goes wrong, not according to the plan. They did issue an appeal to the population of Kiev, the Ukrainian capital, to leave according um, in this particular direction with a promise that they would not be abused, which nobody, I don't, I don't think anybody even attempted to evacuate in this particular direction. But it also means that Russia really did not adjust its plans. And that means that they're in for, for a variety of unpleasant surprises, of course, it would not be possible to even fulfill plan B because apparently the Russian military is now using the second echelon of forces prepared for the planned invasion of the Ukraine west of the river Dnipa. They're now using these forces to take over eastern and southern Ukraine, which according to the calculation should have surrendered pretty much on its own. So the, the um, disconnect from uh, modern notions of identity and allegiance and the belief in the strength of Russian ethnic sentiment in other countries, which of course we will all immediately see as strikingly similar to the way World War II started, um, that brought Mr. Putin into, into a corner. 
Also, he projects himself as a strong leader who is dictating his demands. I think it's fairly clear to everybody in Russia that they need to mobilize the reserves now. They need to ask other countries um, for support in this war. And, and they also must realize that even if they reach a local success, if they win some battles, they will lose the war in any case. And they have already lost it because it's logistically, strategically impossible for them to uh, sustain a war in which all the Ukrainian cities and not just the eastern and southern Ukraine are going to defend themselves so staunchly. So they don't know what to do. But that's perhaps the most dangerous situation you can possibly imagine from the point of view of international relations. Um, when we have really a dictator whose picture of the world is not objective, uh, in that nobody would dare to tell him that the calculation was wrong, that um, your ideas about Ukrainian identity, which Putin expressed himself very famously in his press conferences and articles he claimed to write, claimed to have written, that these ideas are wrong, right? So dictators don't actually realize that things are going wrong until it is too late. And uh, this is the stage at which we are right now. And the immediate implication of this um, completely flawed, completely mistaken Russian notion of what Ukraine is and what the world is, it may have very serious implications for the international order. In the short run, um, it looks like the Russian strategy in the last couple of days would be to pound the Ukrainian cities with uh, all kinds of artillery um, and missiles, even the very, very large ones, which would wake up everybody in the city if, if it explodes, even in the distant suburb, which is precisely what happened in Kiev when the Iskander missile, ballistic missile, uh, was used. So, um, but that also means, on the one hand, acknowledging that the original concept, the original vision of what Ukraine was, was wrong and completely wrong. It's becoming very difficult for the Russian press to keep saying that Ukraine is run by neo-Nazis because that backfired internationally because of uh, the Ukrainian president's Jewish identity and the universal support he has within the country. Um, right now, as of this morning, the Russian press does not use the term the Ukrainian army, but always uses instead the nationalists. And this sort of creates an even bigger tension in the Russian picture of the world because quite simply, you cannot claim that you are liberating the Russian uh, brothers and sisters and Russian speaking brothers and sisters. And at the same time, being unable to take the cities because the Ukrainian nationalists are resisting. So Putin is essentially building even more tensions into the Russian public discourse that are based on his own worldview. And this will have implications for the Ukrainian cities, unfortunately, uh, with grave concern. Uh, we need to recognize that it is very unlikely that there would be a statement from Mr. Putin saying, well, I'm sorry, I should have read history books and sociological research. I was misled by my advisors. Not the thing he can do. Not the thing he can do because the kind of authority he enjoys is the so-called charismatic authority. Um, practiced by dictators and politicians who think that being the biggest macho on earth is the best way to becoming popular ruler. The authority tends to be, of course, as you know, based not on electoral victories, but rather on the concept of uh, uh, love and admiration the people have for them. And that also shapes these rulers in a certain way, populist, populist macho politicians like Bolsonaro, Erdogan, and Putin famously, with bare-chested photographs, uh, riding horses, fishing, whatever. Um, what it also means that it's extremely difficult for this type of authority to acknowledge any mistake. But especially a mistake which led to a bloody war and significant casualties to his own people. So essentially, Putin was in a situation of Nicholas II 
uh, the Russian Tsar in 1904, who felt that, well, that there is a revolution, revolutionary ferment in society, but a little successful war would be good. And that's precisely what Putin has done here. He walked into the trap of his own making, thinking that it's going to be a quick and successful war, which would push his approval ratings all the way through the roof. And that would be an easy solution, both for him and for the Russian concept of the world. Now, when this is not going to happen, um, dictators like that, they do remember what happened to their predecessors who was killed in the ditch, who committed suicide, who was found in the bunker, who killed himself in the bunker. Everybody knows how dictators end. And so there isn't really any choice for Mr. Putin but to look for a solution that would appear, appear to be a great Russian victory. And if such a solution is not found, if Ukraine does not agree to a settlement that would be advantageous to Russia, then Mr. Putin really has no alternative. Either he would employ more and more troops and more and more assist, arm, arm, armament systems and keep killing more and more Ukrainian civilians, hoping that that would undermine the spirit of the nation. Or he will lose faith. He will lose his authority within the Russian society. And he may well be overthrown, not by the Russian people at this point, but by somebody from the Russian elites. He is aware of that. And there is more than one reason why he is uh, sitting in his bunker uh, beyond the Urals in the Asian chest, the part of Russia. It's not just because the flying time of any hypothetical rockets would be much longer for that destination. That's also because he, he wants to be in full control of his own situation. He doesn't want to be overthrown by his own elites. So as you see, um, it's based really on, on a rejection of modern notions of identity, on going back to the 19th century for the notion of the great Russia as an empire, which all the even non-Russians living in Russia, um, uh, minorities and former members of the Soviet Union, all of them should adore Russia. And also on the notion of blood and belonging, the, more, the one more typical of World War II, in which it's actually the ethnic Russian identity and being a culturally Russian in Ukraine that would determine the loyalties of these people. It would be extremely difficult to acknowledge the error of his ways. So there is no easy solution for Mr. Putin. And there is no easy solution for Mr. Putin that would work for the Ukrainian civilians. And that's perhaps most unfortunate. So we start with conceptual notions, but, but arrive at, at the present day military situation. And we look at the consequences of it. But now, let's actually look at Russia. Russia is, as you realize, a huge country with a very significant middle class. Educated professionals who used to be spending lots of time on the internet and abroad. And um, liberal intellectuals in the big cities tended to be oppositional to Mr. Putin's regime. Um, and in the last few years, Russia has conducted a remarkable campaign, closing off any opportunities for civil society to participate, any at all. And this was, in a way, a preparation to the war against Ukraine. But in another way, the war against Ukraine itself was an assault on the Russian society. Uh, let me explain what I mean. Um, Ukraine went through two democratic popular revolutions in the 21st century. Both of them were against, were fought against a pro-Russian ruler. Pro-Russian not just in a sense of ethnic identity, but more, more like in a sense of political identity, with authoritarian tendencies, with a desire, if not the ability, if not always the ability, to control the population. And the plan to build a state similar to Mr. Putin's state. Russia 
was observing these revolutions in Ukraine, um, this fairly strong feelings, and I mean the Russia represented by Mr. Putin here. Um, it was very clear to the entire world and to the Russian elites that popular revolutions were fought in the name of democracy. The Russian explanation was, of course, different. But they were provoked by the West in order to undermine the legitimate authority. So here we deal with different notions of democracy. Uh, those of us who work on Russia are aware that Russia no longer actually, that the Russian official media and officials don't really speak about democracy anymore at all, but rather about sovereign democracy, the unique Russian form of democracy. They now also speak of a sovereign internet, which would be completely separate from the world internet. So the term sovereignty is used in a peculiar way here, but also the term democracy is now colored in, in, in negatively in the Russian uh, official discourse, unless it is very clear that they speak of a sovereign democracy, which pretty much means the continuation of Mr. Putin's rule for as long as he is alive. So after watching the first Ukrainian revolution in 2004 and 2005, Russia faced in 2011 a massive rallies of protest in its own big cities, particularly in Moscow and St. Petersburg, but also elsewhere throughout Russia. The protests, the mass protests were caused by the public understanding that there would be no end to Mr. Putin's rule. That after that first Mr. Putin tried one strategy, uh, switching seats with Mr. Medvedev, uh, serving some time as prime minister and then coming back as president and so that that would work if you keep switching seats like, forever but then it actually the russian political system the way it is anchored in putin's persona didn't tolerate that interestingly enough and also they felt that perhaps actually having any change in authority would in itself be subversive and so they went instead for rewriting the constitution and allowing Mr. Putin to serve whatever number of terms. And if need be, they will rewrite the constitution again. And there are, of course, even voices to crown him as emperor of Russia, emanating from some circles in the Russian Orthodox Church. Now, seeing that the Russian society rebelled in 2011 against the notions of uh, fixed elections with the only real candidate. Mr. Putin preferred to interpret it as the Western assault on Russia. And that was the official interpretation. That all these protests in Moscow and Petersburg and everywhere were caused by Western interference. But they were really scared by something else, by the Ukrainian example from 2004, 2005. So after 2011, Russia systematically cuts the, cuts the avenues for uh, civic action within Russia, eliminates uh, any seats of the opposition. Opposition is really only now represented just, it's, it's only for appearances in some municipal councils, like very few of them. No opposition in the national parliament. And only three oppositional newspapers and or television stations of which two have been now closed and the third one is forced to observe a very um, kind of difficult line not making too many statements i can just say that i actually gave a long interview to one of those outlets which obviously was not published or aired now what does this mean really it means that in fighting Ukraine, Mr. Putin's regime is fighting its own society. Because Ukraine can serve as an example that presidents do change, that there is an opposition in the parliament, and you can get all kinds of opinions in the media. Ukraine could potentially be an even better example, but economically it wasn't doing all too well for a variety of reasons I wouldn't go into. Let's say some of them are linked to the way the transition from the Soviet Union was handled, what happened to the elites 
and um, how the economy was privatized. A great many of these features are common to Ukraine and Russia, except Russia has much more natural wells, oil, gas, whatever, diamonds. Now, so if Ukraine were to be economically successful and politically democratic, it would have been a great example for the Russian society that you do not need a dictatorship in order to be to be feeling good about your country. As it is now, um, Mr. Putin has used all kinds of uh, economic mechanisms, including the subjugation of all the oligarchs to the state agenda, in order to argue to the Russians that by being politically conservative, that's what they claim. Russia claims that it is the most consistent uh, politically conservative state in the world, defending the Europe of Christendom against the assault of European homosexuals, who, the Russian media says, would force all Russians to enter homosexual marriages if Europe wins. And I'm not kidding. That's actually what the Russian propaganda says. So I, I wonder about some of those uh, Western leftists in particular who um, continue seeing Russia positively just because it is anti-American. It is anti-American, but politically it is anti-American because it is much more right-wing even, <laughs> even than Trump administration was. Um, yet, yet old sympathies die hard and they realize that obviously. Now, so, so if Mr. Putin is at war with his own society, that actually explains quite, quite a lot of things. Uh, if after 2011 he started closing all uh, channels of contact with the West, ex expelling Western humanitarian organizations, cracking down on um, Russian human rights bodies, most recently the Memorial Foundation, which was the leading Russian human rights body, or which also worked very notably on the Stalinist crimes, which has now been officially closed. And there isn't much left in terms of the um, avenues for Russian civil society to develop. Um, Putin's aim here is not just to protect his own regime, but also to do something uh, we can observe in Stalinist Russia, namely the atomization of society, which makes it possible for rulers like Stalin to pursue the great terror and and to have unquestionable authority. And now, um, of course, in this fight against its own society, Putin's regime could not afford to have a successful European Ukraine. And that is primarily the reason why in 2014, following the second Ukrainian revolution, Russia took decisive steps, including the occupation of the Crimea. The occupation of the Crimea was a move which was aimed to, to, to support, to prop up both versions of Russian identity, the ethnic one and the imperial one. Crimea is an important symbol of Russian imperial history because of the Crimean War, um, and also the defense of uh, Crimea in World War II, which is portrayed uh, in, in, in Russia as heroic, even so it was um, terrible and tragic, and some would say criminal as well, abandoning the troops, evacuating the commanders at the last phase of the defense and such. Um, but it, but it, it, it fueled both brands of Russian patriotism. That was the return to the glory days of the Russian Empire. It was also the liberation, quote unquote, of the ethnic Russians living abroad. And the ethnic Russians living in the Crimea were willing to bring flowers and to welcome the Russian troops. Now, some of them are not that enthusiastic, but of course, Crimea is not just ethnic Russians. Right? So what is getting, what is getting uh, erased there is the notion that ethnic Russians came to constitute the majority in Crimea uh, in the course of one night or a single night. You don't get that very often in history, do we? Um, and that was the night in May 1944 when Stalin had deported all the Crimean Tatar population, including women and children, everybody. So that genocidal deportation, which historians estimate resulted in one quarter of the Crimean Tatars dying en route and uh, soon after the arrival into new places, that was what made Crimea Russian. Um, so it's not just about empire 
It's also about genocide then. and the ethnic cleansing, which is not acknowledged. And the policies pursued now in the Crimea against the Crimean Tatar activists who are accused of being Islamic radicalists. Um, and many of them simply disappear. Right. So that was the move Mr. Putin felt was a great success. And for all we know, for all we know, the polling, the polls of uh, Russian of the Russian population did produce did produce such an impression that his popularity went up all the way into the 80% territory. Um, the Donbas, however, the war they started in the Donbas, uh, a territory on the Russian-Ukrainian border, a depressed mining region, was somewhat different. That involved, that involved um, the territory where the war lasted really for eight years. And this is the reason why um, many of my Ukrainian friends and colleagues get upset with, with the statement that um, the war began. It never ended for them, or for Ukraine and Russia for that matter, because the war continued in the Donbass and the territory, the territory in the Ukrainian East, along the, the Russian border, where the Russian troops have been involved literally from the very start. And apparently the very separatist insurgency there was the result of a special operation by uh, Russian intelligence as well. Um, now, one thing, it is one thing for Europe and the world not to acknowledge that the war has been going on with all kinds of consequences, including massive displacement, casualties, literally every week. And, the greatest unreported uh, migration crisis, perhaps, in recent times. It is estimated that 1.5 million people from the Donbass resettled within Ukraine. Russia also claims that something like a million, perhaps 900,000 resettled in Russia. Um, and that ends um, in having a territory in which the only population left is the one very comfortable with the war, benefiting from it in a variety of ways. Um, and in many cases, it's also the depressed industrial region which produces, produces the people who are willing to join whatever militia as well, because it's a paycheck as well as, as, as uh, the vocation and as well as an ideological position. So that also means that like in many situations in the world with the involvement of one major power organizing what they call a civil war in the neighboring country, that from now on, it's very misleading to claim that the Russians of the Donbass want to be separate from Ukraine. Because the Donbass has lost more than a half of its population. And those who are not comfortable with living under Mr. Putin's oppressive regime have left. And as I've just showed, Crimea is pretty much in the same situation, except the forced, the forced population change, forced deportation, which by the way, even the UN definition of what genocide is, uh, happens there much earlier. So uh, it also means that we need a different optics in looking at in looking at what is purported to be the popular opinion and the preference of the people on some territories, if these territories have been de facto occupied for eight years, and whoever could escape, escaped. And I assume that many people escaping into Russia were not necessarily Mr. Putin's huge patriots, but they just didn't want to live in under the conditions of war as well, right? So, it's becoming then difficult for us to evaluate what the people want, but most importantly, who the people are. The question, which was very pronounced, I think, in Crimea, because uh, the overwhelming majority of, uh, of Russians in the Crimea, and for that matter, Ukrainians in the Crimea, were recent settlers within the memory of one generation. A significant percentage of them are actually the people who migrated, taking the place of the deported back in the 1950s, and who felt extremely threatened 
by the return of the Crimean Tatars precisely because the Tatars were trying to either claim, reclaim the property or to be assigned any other pieces of land, uh, fairly valuable land, the closer to the sea uh, you get because it's a vacation area. What does the situation tell us? Well, that's settler colonialism, I'm sorry. So if we live in the time of decolonization, we have to be consistent with the evaluation of um, international politics as well. And that's precisely the case of a colonizing group defending its rights by appealing to human rights. So ethnic Russians and the Crimea claiming that they needed to be protected against Ukraine and the Crimean Tatars actually represent the imperial group of recent settlers who came there after genocide. And that, I think, puts things in a very different perspective. But it also shows how you never, you never lose sight of uh, the concept of empire when, de when dealing with Mr. Putin's Russia. Now, um, depending on how much time I still have for my talk, any indication? Can you write to me in chat how much time I still have? Continue. 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 Okay. Please. Continue. So now I want to actually return to international politics. So if we have established that the big problem is in fact with Russia's identity today, which is not a developed national identity, but rather some kind of strange combination of imperialism with ethnic nationalism typical of the mid 20th century radical regimes. Then the immediate question is, well, what is then going to happen next? Ukrainians are completely justified in claiming that they are not fighting for themselves, but they are rather fighting for Europe. That's because the most recent Ukrainian revolution was famously fought under the slogan of joining Europe. And that's why the European Union now feels that they need to make a symbolic gesture, an important politically symbolic gesture of putting Ukraine on path towards the uh, accession to the European Union. But that is indeed a symbolic gesture because the country is at war and even becoming a member of the European Union tomorrow would do nothing to protect Ukraine. It would be more like of an apology really from the European Union for having to go through all these consultations, for having countries that are extremely reluctant to sanction Russia for a variety of reasons. Either they have a right-wing populist regime like Hungary does, um, which makes you political friends with Mr. Putin, or because of being addicted to the Russian gas and other natural resources, which of course uh, the European players are now realizing is not tenable because you cannot depend on uh, dictator with a skewed picture of the world in your um, um, heating and power needs and energy needs. So uh, Ukraine did indeed fight under the slogan of joining Europe and in many ways as I have shown, I hope, uh, the fight here is not about Ukraine at all. Ukraine just happens to be the territory in which Mr. Putin wanted to start the war with the West. And if you read the Russian newspapers, which I still have to do for my work, also it is very, very difficult now to read the Russian newspapers. The voice presented in the Russian newspapers are not as an attack on Ukraine, but rather as re responding to the threat from the West. And I imagine, I imagine many, if not all of you would know that the line pushed by the Russian propaganda about the NATO trying to expand into Ukraine is completely false. No matter how many times it is repeated by the Russian television and certain sympathizers of Russia in the West. It's completely false because the NATO had never wanted Ukraine to start with. The last time this question was discussed by the NATO in 2008, very infamously, two European countries vetoed any talk of a potential Ukraine admission because it could provoke Russia. So any talk was vetoed 
but Russian still attacked. So what does it tell us? Um, the Russian propaganda plays very skillfully on a certain topics that that sound reasonable to particularly European players, but that are really not. And so in this in this fight, then, as I as I try to argue, Mr. Putin is really fighting against the West more generally and against his own people, really. So Ukraine stands for the oppositional elements in Russia itself, and it also stands for the West. So that if Mr. Putin manages to defeat Ukraine, which he never will, he would have claimed the victory not over Ukraine at all, but over the West more generally. And that's precisely the reason why it would be so difficult for him to reach any settlement anytime soon on Ukraine, at least not until the Russian society becomes more mobilized, uh, seeing the casualties that are accumulating fast. Also, yesterday, Russia apparently has acknowledged about one tenth, 10% 10 of the real casualties only. But still, but still. But of course, if it is not a fight against Ukraine as such, but rather a fight uh, contest with the West more globally, what would then be next? And this is a question which is now being evaluated by Western political commentators, politicians, and I imagine a variety of intelligence agencies as well. Um, they're trying to figure out whether, whether Mr. Putin is a rational political actor or not. But I think the real question from Mr. Putin's view is uh, whether he can get away with uh, an attack on Ukraine and and still be accepted as the ruler, as a legitimate ruler of Russia. So that's a big question for the West now, because it's very clear to, to the nations closest to Russia, those in Eastern Europe, that they are under immediate threat. The Baltic states and Poland have indicated very clearly, as did Romania it's a bit later, that um, they would not be comfortable having a common border with Russia, those of them who currently don't have a common border with Russia, and that the Ukrainian defeat would mean an immediate threat to them. And they happen to be NATO members. Um, of course, one of these NATO members is particularly vulnerable, and we are talking about Latvia, the smallest of all the three Baltic states. Um, Latvia has a significant Russian minority, which lives compactly close to the Russian border. So it's a, an obvious pretext, potential pretext for Mr. Putin to try and liberate the Russian speakers there, or I think Russian there. But Latvia is a member of the NATO alliance. So Mr. Putin's recent rhetoric, a very alarming rhetoric about using the nuclear arsenal or potentially using a nuclear arsenal on any country which uh, interferes into his fight against Ukraine is not just a threat calculated for that particular conflict. It's also a testing moment, you know, trying trying the water, how the West would react if we threaten a nuclear war, because there are every there is every reason to believe uh, that in considering subsequent moves, Mr. Putin would actually evaluate. Uh, the resolve shown by the West in defending Ukraine when looking at other possible victims of the Russian aggression. So this is deeply problematic um, for a variety of reasons. And it's actually, as, as has been observed by a great many people, it's bringing Europe together in a new way. After all these controversies and a difficult time for the European Union, and the time when the American president openly acknowledged that it's actually very difficult to keep the European allies uh, in the same line with us, having the same, the same vision of what is happening in Ukraine and what is going to happen next. Um, Europe is getting more united as opposed to Mr. Putin's effort of many years to, to disunite it, to divide it uh, by putting a lot of money into supporting right-wing political parties, certain media outlets, 
by blackmailing with uh, deliveries of gas and giving extremely lucrative jobs to those European officials who are very friendly to Russia, famously the former chancellor of Germany, Gerhard Schröder. Now, what does it mean for the future of Europe? I'm not going to suggest that a nuclear hit is coming soon on Europe. On Ukraine, it could be a different matter. If Putin is unable to defeat Ukraine for a long time, and if there is no significant opposition within Russia, there is no feeling for him that, that he needs to end this war because otherwise Russia would rebel, um, nothing is off the table. Now that he has used Iskander rockets, which um, I'm not a military expert, but it would be actually very interesting to see whether ballistic rocket, uh, rockets of that size and capability have been used before at all. Like mass bombing of cities was done in Syria by the Russian troops, uh, most infamously at Aleppo. And now the Ukrainian city of Kharkiv is fast becoming a symbol of, uh, of a city being bombed by superior military power. But using the ballistic missiles uh, like Iskander, that's already um, rise, raising the stakes quite, quite a bit, quite a bit, especially when they're aiming at a major city. Um, now, what, what does it mean? We are back to the Cold War. And I am sure there will be people blaming the West for that. Oh, the West is somehow responsible always. Mr. Putin is such a wonderful fellow. He's standing up to the Americans. But the reality is nobody wanted the Cold War. Nobody wanted the Cold War, and it's actually being forced upon us. And if it were not Ukraine, it would have been something else. Because uh, the way Mr. Putin's regime evolves, pretty much predetermined that the alienation from the West and the conflict with the West had to happen in some form, had to happen in some form, it was forced uh, by Mr. Putin on Ukraine, thinking that it would be the easiest way to win over the West in general, generic West. But he's not going to stop. And I, don't, I think the assessment made public of the American intelligence sources is probably correct on this, that he isn't going to stop either in Ukraine or more widely uh, because of the way his authority within Russia develops because he now has cut all the channels of communication to his own society, other than direct repression. But perhaps most dangerously, because he is now prepared or perhaps have already given the nuclear weapons to an ally. And I haven't seen too much reaction to that, uh, possibly because this issue is still being evaluated by Western experts. Not too many people in the world noticed that Belarus, the country bordering on both Russia and Ukraine, related to them in terms of language and culture, but really an oppressive dictatorship uh, in Europe since, since the 1990s, really. And now the president has changed the constitution, enabling him to serve until 2035. He hopes to live that long. Um, and his son is being prepared to succeed if need be. That president, the president of Belarus, recently faced a revolution in his own country in 2020. Uh, the people refused uh, to allow yet another term for him. There were mass uh, protests, which he did manage to suppress. Most of the Western countries um, basically proclaimed him illegitimate from that point on. And there is an oppositional candidate living in Europe who is considered the legitimate president of Belarus. So that particular ruler, President Lukashenko of Belarus, may become just as dangerous. May become just as dangerous because apparently, apparently he has received some kind of a signal from Russia about either recovering the Belarusian capability to produce nuclear weapons or actually receiving nuclear weapons from Russia. What he said publicly was that he would ask Russia for the nuclear weapons and will receive them. The calculation here 
is a very transparent one. A dictator who has very little support within his own country, Belarusians like Ukrainians, um, how to put it, more united, more mobilized for political causes. They fight against the police. At least they put up a good fight. So if Lukashenko too acquires or receives or develops nuclear weapons, that would be a precedent for dictators worldwide. This is how you stay in power forever. You get uh, nuclear rockets, then the West is too afraid to engage with you, then your dynasty is going to rule forever. That's not a good signal, but perhaps even more frighteningly, it's a signal in the middle of Europe. According to some geographers, it's either Northwest Ukraine or Belarus where the geographical center of Europe actually is. And it also means that the flying distances for the rockets, which apparently Mr. Putin is very fond of calculating the flying time of the rockets, how much time it would take for, for the rockets to reach Moscow. Well, I think if that happens, then lots of nations in Central and Eastern Europe would have to start calculating the flying distance from Belarus to themselves. And that brings us not just to the Cold War in rhetoric and in the need to support democratic opposition um, in authoritarian regimes, but it also brings us back to the Cold War of competing how many rockets you have and whose rockets are larger. So we have played this game, we know exactly how it goes, but it looks like uh, it's going to happen again also because Belarus in the same referendum, in the same referendum has, if you trust Lukashenko's referenda, of course, which most people don't trust his referenda, but nevertheless, he has asked for the permission to leave the Budapest memorandum. Budapest is the capital of Hungary, as you know, and that's the place where in the early 1990s, post-Soviet countries, which had nuclear weapons on their territory, signed the agreement to recycle them, to get rid of them, um, by transferring them to Russia in exchange for uh, in exchange for the guarantees of sovereignty and territorial integrity. There was not even any financial compensation for them. Rather, Ukraine in particular was compensated with, um, with fuel for nuclear power plants, which is ridiculous, but nevertheless. So, um, if Belarus now officially has left that agreement, um, it means very serious things for nuclear non-proliferation. So it becomes more than European issue, it, become, it becomes a, uh, a global issue. And the global issue also means that going forward, the United States and China in particular would have to take uh, clear positions on what is happening. And this is where I'm, I think I'm going to end my presentation and I hope I have demonstrated that it's not about Ukraine at all, but the fact that it's not about Ukraine doesn't make it any easier for Ukrainians in the besieged cities. And also the acknowledgement that it's not at all about Ukraine only makes us in other countries think harder about what comes next and how we can uh, protect peace and stand up to military aggression. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sergey. Thank you so much for this. We have half an hour now for um, discussion. We'll monitor the chat as well. But if you'd like to, um, if you feel comfortable putting your video on, please uh, feel free to do that. Keep your microphone muted, though, however, until you have a, uh, a question. And you can either use the hand function in Zoom or sort of wave to us, and we will, uh, we will, we will uh, uh, draw on you. Uh, Natalie, can we ask you to start? Hi, Sohei. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Thank you very much for such a cohesive and masterful weaving together of really disparate elements of what is a very complex story. I, I really appreciate the historical background. There were certainly some revelations for me in that presentation, so thank you so much. I'd like to 
I have several questions. I'll limit myself to one to start. I'd like to ask you to say a few more words about something that you touched on at the end, but that I think is probably a source of confusion for a lot of people. And that's the, the precise nature of the security guarantees that were included in the Budapest Memorandum. I know that that was the subject of very tortured conversations between Ukraine and particularly the United States in the three years or so preceding the signing of that mem memorandum. And I think it's very imperfectly understood exactly. I mean, quite often people say, well, the UK and the, and the United States were signatories to the Budapest mem memorandum and they're failing to fulfill their, the security promises that they made. I wonder if you're able to say a few words about that to clarify for all of us um, the nature of the understanding that was reached at that time. Thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to say a few words. I'm not really an expert on that particular episode in diplomatic history, but I think the important point is that um, at the time, nobody really cared all that much about the guarantees from the Western allies. What really mattered was the Russian recognition that Russia recognizes a Ukrainian sovereignty and territorial integrity. And the West served more like witnesses really in this particular situation. But of course, Russia also concluded its sovereign uh, um, treaty of friendship with Ukraine in 1997, which likewise guaranteed uh, territorial integrity. And of course, Russia went on to violate all these treaties. So after the seizure of the Crimea and the start of the war in the Donbas, the public opinion in Ukraine turned towards the issue of the responsibility of the West. So whereas in 1994, it was thought, well, the best thing is that Russia has agreed. Because making Russia agree to recognize the borders was not a simple issue. It was a major issue at the time. It should not be taken for granted. Um, and in fact, Ukraine and others saw it as, as a sacrifice. Like we agreed to whatever to make Russia recognize our borders. That was a very tense moment in the mid-1990s. But now, of course, after whatever so many decades, um, when it's obvious that Russia does not follow up on its international agreements, the public opinion in Ukraine turned around and said, well, what about the West? If they were signatories of this agreement, it was also um, endorsed later by France and China, I think, if I'm not mistaken. So what is the responsibility of the West in this situation? And it was at that point that Western diplomats revealed um, to the Ukrainian colleagues that they never considered this a binding agreement, uh, forcing them to defend the Ukrainian territory if attacked. And I think that's not unexpected, right? But also, the context when these explanations are made. And most recently, the German ambassador to Ukraine made a public statement about that, which was carried by the press and caused quite an outrage in Ukraine, like coming from Germany of all countries, which was the occupying power in Ukraine, both in World War I and World War II. And just a historical aside, Ukraine had been the largest German colony in both World War I and World War II, actually the largest German colony ever, because people think it would be somewhere in Africa, but no, it was actually in Europe. So when the German ambassador made this comment that it was never really understood by the West as a binding agreement, which would require us to put the boots on the ground, well, I think, I think the historians and diplomats and uh, the Ukrainian statesmen and women realized that from the very start. But the Ukrainian public was quite taken aback by this. Also because um, it was the United States that put so much pressure on Ukraine in the 1990s to surrender the nuclear arsenal. That was just before, just before the moment when the first Clinton administration recognized 
that Russia cannot be your main ally in Europe. And prior to that, uh, the old line continued from, from the Bush, Bush the father, uh, Bush the senior, um, that Russia is the most important person, uh, state in the post-Soviet space. So if, if, you, if you maintain good relations with Russia, Russia would control that space for you. But Russia was becoming increasingly erratic uh, internationally. Yeltsin showed his own parliament in 1993 and all kinds of strange things were happening in Russia. But just before the Clinton administration discovered Ukraine as a cornerstone of security in that part of the world, the Americans applied enormous pressure to the Ukrainian authorities and Ukraine was in the middle of an economic crisis. And there were voices that Americans don't understand. We will be left alone with Russia. And that would make a huge difference if we still had some rockets. Also, Ukraine didn't really have operational control over the Soviet weapons located in Ukraine, but because they were also made in Ukraine, as a matter of fact, um, I'm sure there would have been some solution. So it's, it's more like a moral indignation now towards the West rather than the actual claim by diplomats um, or leaders of Ukraine that you should have protected us. But it's the moral, I think, burden upon, upon the West of having forced Ukraine to do this in the full knowledge of um, the Russian nationalism being a threat to Ukraine. I'm not sure I really answered your question, but I hope I sort of provided a bit of a context. That was very helpful. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you for that, Natalie. Lawrence. Um, yeah, thanks, Martin. Uh, and thank you, Sarah. Yeah, it was, uh, I agree with Natalie. It was really um, compelling and, and engaging talk, and you cleared a lot of things up. Um, in this whole situation, I'm really drawn to the different historical parallels and different, you know, visions of Russian history that are being applied. You know, Putin is invariably compared to either, you know, the Soviet period or the imperial period before that, you know, wanting to recreate himself as the Russian empire or, you know, Stalin or whatever. Um, but those are definitely the two main comparisons. And what I find really interesting is it sort of, it, it almost goes unsaid that the assumption is that it's sort of inevitable that Russia has this authoritarian streak this tendency that it's sort of always it was always going to end up here with a strong man and an authoritarian system once again and uh what i wanted to ask about what i'm really interested in is something you mentioned these these oppositional forces within russia you know this potential third vision of what russia can be or or might be it doesn't have to be tsarist it doesn't have to be you know soviet it might it might have some other uh identity or some other political future um, and specifically, my question is, do you think it's at all likely or feasible that this whole um, conflict, this renewed war in Ukraine, is, might be an inflection point to empower that third vision of Russia, that it might sort of weaken the authoritarian um, tendencies in Russia, not, not obviously in the short term, but sort of over the, the medium and long term, and might empower those who say, okay, enough is enough. You know, we've had enough of Putin. He's driving our country into the ground. There might be this potential third way we can run the country. Or is that maybe just an optimistic and a naive understanding of Russian politics on the ground? I mean, you kind of gave the impression that Putin isn't going anywhere. So I suppose, could you just expand and maybe talk on how, yeah, how plausible you find that, that third wave and, and the relation to this Ukraine situation? Right. It's a great question. Could spend an entire lecture working on it. <laughs> yeah, um, sorry. Coming to terms with your country's imperial past is actually a very difficult process, as we know. Like France went through it uh, starting in the 60s. Um, it took Germany a lot to start processing its Nazi past as well. And because, as we now realize, in Nazi conquests, in Europe were intended precisely as colonial conquests, right? So it takes decades. It requires soul searching of the highest degree. And it's not easy to channel the ordinary Russians into thinking about this 
they're in a way seduced by the standard of life uh, which they came to expect based on uh, the s sale of Russian gas and oil and whatever minerals. And this seduction of empire, when it is confirmed by economic factors, is quite powerful. It shapes your identity. So I think the sanctions are going to ultimately work, but I'm not sure they're going to work on the oven because they can produce a reaction of, well, it's really the West which is responsible for for the way we now live. So the good old life was under Putin before the war, right? So it's, it depends on which way the society goes. Is it Mr. Putin's responsibility or is it the responsibility of the West which allows nationalistic mobilization along the axis of uh, Russian history constantly being um, um, struggle with the West? So that's, that's, that's a big question. Those of us who still have open avenues of communication with Russian colleagues um, try to signal in, in, in a variety of ways in public posts and whatever that it's impossible really for the West to transform Russia precisely because Mr. Putin has an enormous nuclear arsenal and is constantly demonstrating his willingness to use it. So it would have to be his unpopularity in the Russian society and mass protests by ordinary Russians that end his rule. But that clashes also with the notion of a national pride when it is an unprocessed imperial pride. Russians were never really an ethnic nation. They were always masters of either the Russian Empire or the Soviet Union. And it's quite painful um, for empires, as, as, as we know, even from the examples of British Empire as well. Like it was our king who agonized over losing this, this E on the coins. He would still have the R as Rex, but no longer um, em imperator, emperor, right? So, but it's, it's very difficult for Russia because that conversation with history has not even started. Like Russia has been going into the opposite direction of anything. Um, the urban middle class, I'm sure, will produce under the circumstances a lot of protesters, but they would have to be able to mobilize in some way. Um, if the internet is controlled, if Facebook and Wikipedia and whatever um, are closed, it becomes fairly difficult to mobilize. So I'm not quite sure where that could potentially start. The obvious avenue, which the Ukrainian authorities and the West are hoping for, is that the mounting casualties, the number of body bags going back to Russia, would do the trick. And that was definitely what did the trick with the Soviet war in Afghanistan. But that's not a fair comparison because Afghanistan was never seen as part of an empire. Ukraine is. Um, Afghanistan was um, the later stage of the war in Afghanistan was fought under the conditions of glasnost introduced by Mikhail Gorbachev, much maligned in present day Russia, by the way. Um, so people could, uh, the media could publish oppositional pieces and could call for the end to the war. The huge movement of soldiers' mothers could start. But if the society is completely controlled with the aim of atomizing the people, never allowing them any kind of institutional base or even technological medium which to use for this mobilization, I think that would be very difficult. Um, the body bags are on their way. But as some of you know, Russia is not going to send them back. And that, and that was apparently one, one courageous senator raised that issue in the Russian Senate, but that was only covered by one newspaper, the only oppositional newspaper, which uh, not too many people read. But the Russian line is actually not to send back, not to collect the bodies which I would say clashes with imperial pride in a major way.
but the Putin regime realizes uh, its survival is at question. So they don't want the body bags to come back, which is quite amazing. So I don't know where this is going to end and in what way. Uh, so I, I think I said at the start that at this point, it is more likely that um, Mr. Putin's um, politics would be seen as liability for the Russian elites. But I'm not convinced that the Russian elites would be able to remove Mr. Putin. I'm not hopeful at that moment for the Russian society. I'm hopeful for the Russian society in the long range, though. So. And it can be complicated under sanctions, can't it? Sanctions can go both ways. It can, it can, it can build resentment amongst the population, but it can also strengthen the government in terms of having that much more power over population or the material with which it now has to demonize those imposing the sanctions. Natalie, did you? Sorry, I don't really have a question. <laughs> I have many, many questions. But Natalie, did you have a follow-up? I feel the same, Martin. I, I really do have a follow up based on on the very interesting response to Lawrence's question. And forgive me if I if this is asked out of ignorance, but my impression is that the alliance between the Russian Orthodox Church in its resurgence and Putin's leadership has been a very successful one on both sides, and that the the Russian Orthodox Church is the only institution I can think of that isn't subject to the atomization policy that you've described so vividly and so chillingly. Is there, I have no insight into how the Russian Orthodox Church works, but is there any possibility that the basic uh, precepts of Christianity might be invoked successfully somehow by Russian Orthodox priests to mobile as a source of mobilization of the population? Is there any thought of that at all? It's fairly complex. It's a good question. Um, Russia, like Ukraine, belong to the countries where everybody answers when asked that they are practicing Christians, but where the church attendance is minuscule. So it is sort of a declarative Christianity that you experience in these countries. The overwhelming majority of people visit the church only for baptismal rituals. So regular attendance is tiny, but everybody in the country says that it's Christian. Now, what however happened in Ukraine very famously is that uh, one particular church, a new one building itself in opposition to the Russian church became different. Uh, when the Patriarch of Constantinople granted the Thomas to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, to the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, um, making it autonomous and dissolving any ties with Russia, that church was started building momentum, uh, recruiting the people who would uh, switch from the Russian Orthodoxy to Ukrainian Orthodoxy. But then it was never enough. The attendance remained completely unimpressive. It's just that lots of people who don't believe in God at all suddenly changed uh, pictures on, on, on Facebook saying that they, they now, even so they were atheists, they were atheists of that belonging to that particular church. And that indicated the understanding of patriotic mobilization. And so the church was able to do this by participation in the revolution, uh, by um, protecting the people against the police forces, by caring for the wounded. That other church in Ukraine, the Ukrainian, uh, the uh, Orthodox Church of Ukraine, built itself into the national mobilization and became a very respected and very important force in Ukrainian politics. Whereas the Russian church, the oldest, the largest, the traditional, which still has most parishes in Ukraine, didn't, didn't want to be identified with the Ukrainian side at all. And it remained technically part of the Russian church. So I'm, I guess what I'm saying is two things. One, that even so most Russians say they're religious, they are not. 
and um, they're probably not respecting any political opinions or even any humanistic appeals emanating from the church leadership. Secondly, though, um, secondly, though, there is, um, in addition to that, in addition to the fact that Russians are not really religious, or Ukrainians for that matter, the overwhelming majority, even so they claim they are. In addition to that, there was a very interesting development within Ukraine itself, with the part of the Russian church, which was left in Ukraine. Apparently, the head of this church who was widely seen as pro-Russian, and he infamously uh, refused to stand uh, in the parliament uh, due for the minute of silence for the soldiers killed in the Donbass, which caused a storm on social media. Like, apparently, he made a statement about the fratricidal character of the war, and he brought up uh, the language of Cain and Abel. Um, and if this is true, that would indicate a separation now between the Russian Orthodox Church within Russia, which remains really an official church. They really love putting photographs out of Mr. Putin walking with the head of the church somewhere in the forest, pretending to be deep in conversation and such things. But I don't think it has any real, real possibility for expressing a humanistic appeal. But what, what I found amazing was that the Ukrainian branch of the Russian Orthodox Church immediately broke up, was demonstrated that it was prepared to break up contacts with Russia. And that would be quite a signal if that happens to the Russians, whether they believe in God or not, uh, that the Ukrainian branch of the church has left. Because of course the Russian regime, as I said, positions itself as the most conservative Christian regime on earth, but that would not fit well with the notion of the Orthodox believers in Ukraine being universally opposed to this war. It's too early to say. Thank you, sir. I can't help but be struck by so many parallels with the Middle East and authoritarian dictatorships in that region and this especially post 2011 uprisings, this sort of existential question for the leadership, where do they go? You know, you know there, there is nowhere to go. It's a fight kind of to the finish. It's existential for some of these regimes. Yeah, precisely. And of course, World War II is first becoming an obvious comparison for great many things happening there, especially after a statement from Yad Vashem yesterday from this principal institution in Israel, which is, uh, protecting the memory of the Holocaust and about the fact of the Russian rockets landing actually in the territory itself of the Babi Yar, the greatest uh, extermi extermination site in Ukraine and also the greatest memorial site. And the other rocket apparently landed in the old Jewish cemetery too. And it almost sounds like the ghosts are being raised by a very modern weapon, so. It's a fascinating time. I think we could have a whole talk on that Time magazine cover too. The... Well, thank you so much, Sergei. As, as Tamara and Elizabeth have noted in, in the chat, it's such a very rich and very sobering talk. Um, uh, Sergei, you know that we, the center very much looks forward to future collaborations, or whether it be around a book launch or future, panel webinars, please let's um, uh, stay in touch. And of course, we'll share this with our community as we move forward. Um, again, our thoughts for your family and friends who are in Kiev or elsewhere in Ukraine. So, uh, and, and, and for taking the time of a very busy schedule. Um, uh, please know how much we appreciate all of this. <laughs>